Welcome. It's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richie. Good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today. Breaking down news of the day, my contributor, none other than Mayor W. Mondale Robinson, Mayor of Enfield, North Carolina, finder, founder, excuse me, of Black Male Voter Project, Rebel HQ contributor extraordinaire. Should be a fascinating breakdown given the content in particular that we will deal with today. Top story of the day, according to allegations, Clarence Thomas has been receiving bribes for many years as a Supreme Court justice. The plot thickens even more. Let's go ahead and put his picture up full mass. The only picture of Clarence Thomas smiling, obviously after he just finished a trip with his very rich billionaire Republican friend. A new ProPublica investigation details how Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has now accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars. I actually think it goes into the millions based on my cal calculation, but they're saying hundreds of thousands of dollars from billionaire GOP donor, from a good friend of his, according to him, over 20 years. He has not disclosed any of it, which is a violation of the anti-corruption laws passed after Watergate. Now he has an excuse for this. That excuse came today. I will give you his excuse or his reasoning. This is the same justice, by the way, who refused to recuse himself from cases involving the 2020 election that his own wife tried to overturn based on evidence in record. Since conservatives all of a sudden care about the mere appearance of judicial conflicts of interest, this should be a bipartisan scandal, but it is not. Here's a list of gifts Justice Thomas accepted from a single billionaire, Texas real estate mogul, Harlan Crow. So we have flights on the private jet. We have at least three vacations on a 162 foot super yacht with a private chef. And we have annual stays at the private residence of the billionaire 105 acre resort, which has 25 fireplaces, uh, three boat houses, clay tennis court, a batting cage, and a lifestyle replica of a Harry Potter character, which is weird. Just one 2019 Indonesian trip could have cost more than half a million bucks. Do you understand this? Half a million for one trip if Thomas had paid for it himself. His salary is a mere $285,000. How do you expect him to survive on such a small salary? I mean, he has to keep up with the billionaires in the GOP. No small amount, but it's not enough to be traveling like that. And yes, his wife, Jenny, the Make America Great Again activist, was there too. Shocking. Not Jenny Thomas, not Jenny by the book, Thomas. There's more. Thomas, meanwhile, did not comment initially when the story came out. I do have his comment now. But he's previously tried to appear like an everyman. So in a recent interview for a documentary about his life, this was so laughable, which, by the way, the billionaire funded, at least partially. The justice said, and I quote, I prefer the RV parks. I prefer the Walmart parking lots to the beaches and things like that. There's something normal to me about it. I come from regular stock and I prefer that. I prefer being around that, the Walmart parking lots and the RV. This is big. My favorite meat is hot dog energy. It definitely feels reassuring that the same justice calling for the court to overturn the right to birth control and marriage equality is being wined and dined 
by some of the wealthiest conservatives alive. Now, I want you to understand the context here. He does a documentary. This documentary is paid for by his friend. And in the documentary, he represents a character dynamic about himself that's contrary to the record. He doesn't say he likes yachts, even though the record says he does. He has admitted he does because he admitted these trips are real. He says he likes to go to Walmart. He likes RVs um, because, you know, he comes from normal stock. Let me tell you something. Anybody who talks like that about themselves does not come from the place they are trying to make you believe they come from. Who in the hell talks like that about themselves? All right, so Senator uh, Dick Durbin, Democrat, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, said Thursday that the committee would take action on this information. This behavior is simply inconsistent with the ethical standards the American people expect of any public servant, let alone a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. But guess what? Every court in America has an oversight dynamic or oversight committee. In Georgia, it's called the Judicial Qualifying Commission or the JQC. It is different in different places. This goes from traffic judges all the way to your Supreme Court ju judges per state, except for the United States Supreme Court. They are the ones who do not have an ethical or moral code that's enforceable. In order to enforce a rule against a Supreme Court justice, you must impeach them. That is it. That's your remedy. Now, could his colleagues move to somehow censor him? Sure. It's just paper. It's not much they will actually do beyond that, even though constitutionally, I think they have the power to do so, but they do not have the heart. There's more. Finally, when considering what steps should be taken to further investigate these trips, it might be helpful to imagine if today's news was about, was not about Justice Thomas and Harlan Crow, but about, let's say, Justice Sotomayor and a major Democratic donor. My guess is that House Republicans would spring into action so quickly they forget about Hunter Biden, Hunter Biden's crack pipe, and everything else. Thomas said he sought guidance. This is his response today. He sought guidance from colleagues and others in the judiciary. <laughs> who? Drop some names, sir. We need to know who's part of this conspiracy. At who instructed him that he did not have to report the trips on his financial disclosure statements because they constituted personal hospitality from close personal friends who do not have business before the court. Thomas said the judicial conference recently changed its guidance on financial disclosures and that it is his, and I quote, intent to follow this guidance in the future. Let's go back to his initial statement. He said he sought guidance. Let's put it back up. He sought guidance from who? He sought guidance from colleagues and others in the judiciary who instructed him that he did not have to report the trips on his financial disclosure statements because they constituted personal hospitality from close friends, close personal friends. Well, what does that mean? Uh, to me, that's Justice Clarence Thomas saying that all these judges on the conservative bench do it because I talked to them and they told me it was okay because obviously they know it's okay because they do it. Do you see what I'm saying? I think he just dry snitched is what they call it. There's more. Congressman Hank Johnson, let's put him up. Congressman Hank Johnson out of the state of Georgia released a statement his response, though not surprised, I am deeply disappointed. I am angered by the revelations of this report that Justice Thomas has been brazenly corrupted and compromised by Republican dark money mega donor Harlan Crow. Representative Hank Johnson, ranking member of the Judiciary Subcommittee on Courts, he's also a former judge, by the way, a lot of people forget that, over the past 20 years, as Justice Thomas has sanctimoniously paraded as a pristine and principled man, 
He was being wined and dined with private jet and yacht travel, while also being lavished with accommodations, meals, expensive gifts, including a $19,000 Bible. A $19,000 Bible. So here's the thing. AOC hit it right on the head when she said he needs to be impeached. Period. He does. He may not be the only one, but definitely as it relates to information available publicly. I mean, damn. He is the front runner for sure. But here's the other side of it. If this would have been Sotomayor caught up in a similar situation, a similar circumstance, this dilemma, you do realize the committee to impeach her would have already been impaneled. The investigation would have been well on its way. This, this talk about we need to do something, we need to um, hold them accountable. No, you see, what I've learned is that Republicans hit first and ask questions never. The leadership dynamics are so different. We're being outmaneuvered by individuals who are not as thoughtful, who are not as strategic. They are simply one thing better than the other side. They can message well, and they just go ahead and try to push the envelope, even if it means breaking the law. And we're not advocating anyone to break the law, but damn it, push the envelope, push the agenda, advocate for the communities that actually elected you. Speaking of a man who does advocate for his communities, we have the mayor on the program. Mr. Mayor, have you seen such extreme, at least ethical violations based on the conscience of humanity from a judge who does in fact look at cases that could benefit or harm his dear friend? Yeah, but unfortunately it was always on TV. It was, mm. it was this is not reality. <laughs> right. No one can, if you wrote this, it would it wouldn't even be a script that people would take seriously. A five hundred thousand dollar trip on a hundred and twenty nine foot yacht. People need to understand that's more than half of a football field. A yacht for him and his wife while his wife was being paid from this said person. He can this he can continue to say that this person had no business in front of the Supreme Court. But when you're donating five million dollars to Republican candidates, every time one of the issues they support come into front of in front of your court. Those are his issues That's in your right. court. This is absolutely disgusting. Wherever this gentleman has, has his bar license, I'm talking about Clarence Thomas. People may be confused because I said, gentlemen, that ain't what he is. <laughs> um, but that's what I'm talking about. Wherever his bar license is, that needs to be on the investigations immediately because this is not, this is not ethical by anybody's standards. And I think the fact that these nine, these nine people can expect, you know, live in this space where no one can hold them to any ethical standards is absolutely scary to me. Yep. And we're gonna watch, we're gonna watch Republicans as they already started. If you watch how Fox covered this news, they didn't say mega donor. They tried to downplay it and say, oh, he had a few gifts from a donor. But we're talking about a $19,000 Bible. Now I'm not saying the words in there are priceless, but $19,000 for the Bible itself yeah. sounds like you're cutting off Jesus's word for me. I think what we're seeing though, what we're seeing is the unraveling of the Republican Party and also at, to some extent America's democracy because we have Democrats not afraid or too afraid to fight against this type of stuff too far. You yeah. have Democrats talking about Trump shouldn't have been charged because they're afraid that we're gonna look weak on crime while this person we know committed crimes. But if it was a black person, just in, the, in this case, if it was a black person, it will be something completely different. I'm super, yeah. super, super scared where we're headed with this situation. Very well said, and the irony of the bar investigation, which I agree there should at least be an investigatory uh, dynamic connected to his bar license, but the Supreme Court, based on constitutional standard, allows you to sit on the Supreme Court without a bar license. And I'm sure that will become um, a defense or rebuttal uh, that it doesn't matter that he's being investigated for his professional license to practice law. All right, here we go. Here's the thing. Let's put the picture up full mass. Let's do that first, okay? Three Democratic lawmakers protest gun laws in the state of Tennessee. Two Democratic lawmakers get expelled, lose their job, they're gone. Which ones do you think out of the three you're seeing 
got expelled from the Tennessee House. You guessed it right. Let me give you the background to this. In an update, Tennessee Republican, they did vote to expel two duly elected black members from their post for leading a legal, legal, peaceful protest against gun violence. Here's Tennessee lawmaker Justin Jones and also lawmaker Justin Pearson speaking before the vote to expel them. Here it is. So today we are brought to here where members are responding in the most extreme measure, not because of what we did, but because by breaking the quorum, we broke the glass of your false power for the world to see. We broke the glass of this chamber that someone called sacred. One of the members on the other side of the aisle was in tears and said, I've never seen such a breach of this sacred chamber. And I thought to myself, that representative has obviously never read history. Because is it in this chamber, if you walk around this Capitol, you'll see bullet holes when representatives got into conflict. You'll see duels take place on this House floor, debating whether people like me should be treated like equal citizens under law. This is not a temple. This is a place where we're supposed to wrestle for our democracy and wrestle ideas and give voice to 78,000 constituents each of us represents. But for so long, this body, drunk with power, has modeled for the world what we know as nothing less than authoritarianism. And you are seeking to expel District 86's representation from this house in a country that was built on a protest. In a country that was built on a protest. You who celebrate July 4th, 1776, pop fireworks and eat hot dogs. You say to protest is wrong because you spoke out of turn, because you spoke up for people who are marginalized. You spoke up for children who won't ever be able to speak again. You spoke up for parents who don't want to live in fear. You spoke up for, for, for Larry Thorne who was murdered by gun violence. You spoke up for people that we don't want to care about. Now, they took the vote. They decided to expel two black members of their house. Here's Representative Justin Pearson after the vote. Shirt back from civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is what built this country. Resisting the status quo built the United States of America into the institution that it is, and it's my ancestors' resistance that got me here. And so I will not forget them or forget the struggles of people, especially children who march, children who were beaten by dogs, children who were beaten. If I gotta get expelled, I'll take that. Why do you think that you and Justin Jones were expelled, but Gloria Johnson was not expelled? You cannot ignore the racial dynamic of what happened today. Two young black lawmakers get expelled and the one white woman does not. That's a statement in and of itself. That is the spark. You see, when there's extreme bigotry, when evil has decided to rise, again, there's always an energy that rises with it, stronger than that evil, to combat the forces of darkness. Dr. King was involved in leadership for the civil rights movement because of the darkness he saw in the state of Georgia, in Alabama, in Mississippi, and other places. It caused him to wake up. It caused others to wake up. It causes us to wake up. Now, they want to pass anti-woke legislation because they want you to remain asleep. They want you to not pay attention. They want you to think these things are just silos and not actually connected to an expression of our entire nation. It was Dr. King who said in a later interview that America was more racist than he ever believed. He basically said his hopes were wrong. It's going to take more work than he thought. He said this during an NBC interview. Let's put up the pictures again. Give you some background to this. Gloria Johnson was the lone white woman 
that Representative Pearson was referring to while he and Justin Jones, Justin Pearson expelled. Remember, they, the black lawmakers get expelled. The white lawmaker, Representative Johnson, excuse me, Johnson, she stays. The reason is because all of this comes down to colleagues, I use that term loosely, voting. There's more. The Republican-led vote to expel Pearson and Jones came in the wake of anger from many Tennesseans over the legislature's refusal to consider any new gun control reforms following a mass shooting at the Covenant School. A Nashville school left six people, including three children, dead. The assailant, assailant, a former Covenant student, was killed by the police, used an AR-15 assault rifle, a powerful semi-automatic weapon that has been used in multiple deadly mass shootings and which many argue should be banned. That shooting framed an angry protest at the Capitol, which Jones and Pearson joined. They were upset and emotional. They did not commit violence or domestic terrorism as Trump supporters. Republicans argued that their participation, their mere participation, violated the legislature's rules, an office policy, not a law, an office policy was violated. Using that as a rationale to call to vote to expel them, along with a third Democrat, Gloria Johnson, who was not expelled, she survived her vote. Now, let me say this, the reason she survived her vote and they did not, is because it's not simply about the ideology difference. If this was all about ideological differences and nothing more, all three of them would have received the exact same treatment. This is about young, black, dynamic, unapologetic leadership saying we will represent our people regardless of a job or not. They said you can take this state rep job, shove it up your ass as far as we're concerned if we're not going to be able to effectively represent the people who elected us. Now, they didn't simply disenfranchise the two elected officials. They disenfranchised the 78,000 each of them actually represent. Each of them were elected through the democratic process, a legal election, no issues about them being the victors in their campaign. They did not try to manipulate the outcome of their election. They did not call on others to commit violence. They simply participated in a legally protected constitutional right. Now, all of a sudden, they're out of a job. Here's the thing. This is about putting black people, in particular black men, in their place. And how the vote came out. They wanted you to be sure of their actual intent by only firing or expelling the two black men and keeping the white woman who participated in the same action. There's more. As a result, Justin J. Pearson and Justin Jones are no longer members of the Tennessee House of Representatives after the Republican supermajority in the state legislature's lower chamber voted to oust both men tried to kick out a third following a loud protest at the state's capital in Nashville on Tuesday. Both men are Democrats and both have been elected by constituents in heavily black districts. As of Thursday evening, the Tennessee General Assembly's web pages for each district listed the seats as vacant and photos of both former legislators have now been removed. Pearson had represented Tennessee's 52nd district, which stretches from Nashville's southeast corner and into its suburbs, and it includes Nashville International Airport. Jones 86 district stretches north to south on the west side of Shelby County, including parts of Memphis. The 86 district's residents are 61.1% African American. What are we doing? We're losing grip on democracy, but the reality is democracy has been slipping for many years. This nation never embraced true democracy. It was not founded on democracy. It was founded on principles created by oligarchs, and powerful white men that own things. They were to benefit from the rule of law, the constitution, statutory code, not black people, not women, 
not historically marginalized community. They wanted a system that only governed fairly and gave benefit to white men who had status, influence, and property. What are we today? We are a mere reflection of the DNA that created this nation. Now, can this nation be more? Of course it can. Can we move and journey toward a more perfect union? Yes. Can we actually become a democracy one day? Of course, because systems come down to people and people have the ability to not only transform, but be transferred. All right, Mr. Mayor, thoughts here. I think this is a this is a tragic situation. What we see, though, is in a state where a couple months ago, or actually last month, these Republicans didn't have the same energy of trying to expel one of their colleagues who was calling for black bodies to be lynched again. That's right. Making it a law, codified this as a form of uh, execution, and smiled about it with a sick smirk on his face when he was when he, right presenting right after a black uh, legislator spoke. This is disgusting nature where we're reminded that to be black in America is to have no law that a white man is obligated to respect. This is why these two brothers got expelled and this white woman didn't. She was reveling against white people and white people are allowed to yell against white people. But black people have to have the audacity to stand up is to be uppity and to be uppity is to be deadly to the system, the status quo. So these brothers calling in, calling in the status quo uh, has gotten them kicked out of the legislature. But it also, um, this is this level of sacrifice is going to be required to challenge this level of racism if we are to address it. So I'm proud of these these two young brothers, and also it seems that they both have bright futures ahead of them. Very well said. You're looking at the blueprint, and you know this, Mr. Mayor. They're giving you the blueprint. They're telling you don't you you cannot work with everybody, and sometimes you have to suspend your willingness to be diplomatic and simply say out loud what needs to be said. And that's exactly what these men did. We will follow this and continue to bring you the developments as they come. All right, something we call consequences, repercussions. Here it is. Get out right now. Go. Girl, what is he trying to do? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, let's put the pictures up. You see these uh, two young men, um, exceptional individuals. Okay, let me tell you why. One decided to not even engage in defending himself, he utilized evasive moves not required to, his constitutionally protected right gives him the right of self-defense immediately, okay? But he decided to try to be a pacifist. Good young man there. The second young man, seeing an attack on another person, his colleague, their lifeguard, he gets involved because he's a good young man too. And when he gets involved trying to de-escalate, the violent thug that you see with the ball spot in the back of his head, he decides to take his anger on the individual attempted to de-escalate, take his anger out on him, and proceeds to hit him twice before he is then struck one time, one time to stop the attack, and that is it. You do know if police officers acted in such a way, we would have very little complaint. You have one person literally trying to get away, you have another person trying to de-escalate, and all he does is use reasonable force to stop the aggression of the attacker. Five young men, indeed. Mr. Mayor, do you see this any differently? Not at all. I think what we, what we witnessed was we, we witnessed, we supposed to be a society that's against bullying. We watched this man try to bully these teenagers, probably working on spring break, or yeah. on their summer break, watch this man bully them. And then, like you said, he's attacked the second young man twice. And the response is exactly what he deserved. I think you, when you react that way, I am not a pacifist. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want people to think that I'm, I'm advocating for violence, but I'm, I'm gonna 
meet you the way you show up to me. And I think that young man, the second um, young man, had an uh, he had an uh, he had an obligation as a lifeguard yeah. to protect his other lifeguard. I mean, you you, right. you have this gentleman backing up while this other person is going for it, and I see him getting closer and closer to the edge of the pool, and I'm like, is he gonna fall in and hit his head trying to run from this um, this man attacking him, this thug attacking him? So I appreciate what I just witnessed, and like I think what you said is spot on. If we had police officers with this much self restraint and control, we have a lot more black people living. That's right. Let's put the pictures up one more time. Um, I want to make a recommendation to the company that employs you gentlemen. Um, I would like to see uh, one of you named employee of the month for this month and the other one named employee of the month for next month. All right. Hopefully my word carries some weight with your boss. All right. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. A lot of show left. Let me read a few of these comments. I'm kind of pressed for time. Craig Craig Souffle says, it is a GD shame that we're just learning about Uncle Thomas overt corruption now. Also, Tech Stan says, based on the speeches, I think they picked the wrong young black men to F with. Yeah. Also, Tracy Ravenhawk, welcome to Indisputable. Thank you for your support. Chef Rockstar, thank you for that. Dr. Richie, when I heard this comment about coming from common stock, the first thing I said was, what you did, people like me don't talk like that. They give away he's full of ish. And then, he, and then the documentary is financed by the billionaire he actually does like to hang with. The irony is just unbelievable. Okay, C. Michael Henson, thank you, C. Michael. Correction, that dude got hit twice. Once by the lifeguard, next by the concrete. That's right. Correction. He was hit two times. Okay. Got something for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on him for having a barbecue on a Sunday? You feel French! Back off! I'm going to tell the African American man to threaten my life. Dead. Keep your distance. What did you do? Keep your distance. What did you do? Listen, call him? I'm telling you, what did you social call him? distance. I'm calling what you did a I'm calling you a Use n word? No, I use you. You use n my son? That's my speech. You're not son to me. You're not my mother. Get out of here. Get out of here. Go get your bagels. Shame on you. Get out of here. We're going to drop go. a bomb in Hiroshima. Go ahead. We're going to annihilate Japan and you too. I'm not even Japanese, you idiot. Racist. You want to get with me? Let's go. Fight, let's go. Okay, go ahead. Take this away. Go ahead. You stop. Take that kid away. Don't talk like that. Stop. Yes, you don't You're disgusting. Let's go. Here. I'm so sorry. That's awful. Let's get a picture. That's seriously, dude. Now, my name is Mike. Michael. You're so Michael. hateful. Michael. Stay away from that. You got to love the anti-Karen who comes at the end and says, hey, that's enough. Keep it moving. Now, did he hop out on the anti-Karen like that? No. Did he challenge the anti-Karen to a physical fight? No. Did he say anything that was bigoted to the white male anti-Karen? No. Proving his cowardly behavior for full display. That's unfortunate. No one obviously should have to go through hearing racism, picking up bagels. Um, I am glad this was recorded because it gives an opportunity for reflection. It gives an opportunity for correction. Uh, sir, obviously, you know you're going viral, okay? Maybe this is an opportunity for you to check your overt racism in a way that keeps it on the inside. Uh, now, the real damage is whatever you do for a living. I don't know what you do for a living. You are a manager, supervisor, maybe a business owner. That becomes systemic racism. Your biases will permeate in your managerial position. Uh, this is why we want to make sure that anytime we cover these types of stories, when we don't have all of the information that we ask, if you could provide more, whoever watches this, feel free, contact us. All right, still trying to get more info on the person. Mr. Mayor, racism is real in America. Some people say, oh, not a racist country. Um, but not only is it uh, full of racism uh, and 
uh, bigotry is also full of sexism because I believe part of his uh, action toward this person was because she was a woman. What are your thoughts? I think the fact that we have Asian Americans standing up for Black Americans shows to, to the, the level of, of disrespect that the white America has, 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 has risen to. We mm. right now are watching white men scream, you're not my mother, and that's the only reason you can't tell me not to use the N-word. Are you kidding me? Has that wow. to do with the 400 plus years of racism and torture and trauma that you've explained and passed on to black people? It has nothing to do with that. It's only the fact that your mother didn't say it to you, that it's a negative thing. I also think the fact that white people are comfortable talking about the dropping of an atomic bomb on a civilian city by this country. The only time an atomic bomb was used was twice and it was both by America and it was on civilian populations. And the fact that you're willing to hearken that up, bring that trauma back up for an entire people to have mm -hmm. to deal with is disgusting, disgusting. Right. And I hope I hope your viewers find out who this person is. And he needs to suffer uh, some type of way that can teach him a lesson because it's disgusting that you remind people that America chose high trauma when they dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Right. And people still are living with that. This is not ancient past. There are people that are living today that are suffering from the consequences of America's choice of using chemical bombs on a civilian city. Very well said. Very well said. All right, Candace Owens, all of a sudden she believes in racism um, as it relates to discrimination against her white husband. Uh, let's put it up full mass. Okay, let me give you the background. This is insanity. Candace Owens expressed her outrage to Vanity Fair for David Neto, an interior designer who prefers to stray far away from the antics of her and her husband. Uh, this is them at the White House. This was organized by Turning Point USA. Um, you see the front man there as well, Charlie Kirk. During the interview, Owens told writer Emily Fox, her husband, George Farmer, an Englishman and CEO of the free speech right wing social networking website, Parlor, asked popular interior designer David Neto to work on their home. The couple had seen how he decorated a friend's home in Nashville, and he hoped to be a client and hoped to be a client. With this hope, Farmer reached out to Neto via his website. Now, let me first say this, put the picture up again. All right, once again, these are just Republicans coming from common stock. A lot of common stock Republicans out here, okay? David Neto is a widely renowned interior designer with an amazing career, and he's expensive. Neto has made a name for himself from dropping out of Harvard to owning his own studio, writing a book, and working for the New York Times style magazine. And he's expensive. Vanity Fair released info on the interaction between Farmer and Neto. All right, here it is. It doesn't always go so well. Earlier this year, Owen's husband reached out to the interior designer, David Neto, after the couple saw his work on their friends' homes in Nashville. Farmer filled out the contact, the contact form on the website. My husband wrote the most polite email because he's always polite, she says. He's very English, Owens told me. We didn't know if we could afford a design or anything. <laughs> Neto responded, Dear George, thank you for your inquiry. I'd rather get beat in the ass with a wooden plank than ever go near either of you, kind regards, David. I must say, smashing courtesy from uh, Mr. Neto as well. I mean, these are two very courteous individuals, Candace. I don't know what the complaint is. I mean, let's go back to it. Maybe I missed something. He said, kind regards, comma, David. In the beginning, he says, Dear George, thank you for your inquiry. If I'm missing something, somebody got to tell me because this is, it started courteous, it ended courteous. There's more. Candace tried to put race, 
I got to laugh, not to cry. Candace put race in this. The woman who says racism doesn't exist. Okay? Her husband, her very English husband, gets a rejection via email from a white man. All of a sudden, racism alive and well in the United States of America. You can't make this up. She says, and I quote, if a white conservative male had written that email to an outspoken black liberal, he would have lost everything. They would have just said it was like Jim Crow. Well, here's the thing, Candace. We do have emails like that from racist white people toward uh, black folk who have done nothing to offend them. However, in this scenario, the reason why Mr. Neto wants absolutely nothing to do with you or your husband has to do with your support of terrorist, not skin color. The irony of this whole thing. So the artist contested Owen's defamatory remarks, claiming it has nothing to do with race or Jim Crow. He said, and I quote, it is, it's a terrorism, a morality thing. Before explaining, after January 6th, the joke's over. People like this should expect to be recognized as complicit with something very dangerous. And I don't mean Kanye. And expect to be told off in polite society, Neto said. Adding, without parlor, the Proud Boys couldn't talk to each other. So that's enough for me. Candace tried once more to defend herself by responding on Twitter, but was quickly shut down by user John Paul. Let's put it up. People that claim to be fighting hatred are always the most hateful, bigoted people. Wow, Candace, so you're now saying racism and bigotry actually exist in America. I mean, there may be hope for you here. But it seems as if it only applies when the attack or the conflict has to do with your husband, a white male, who happens to be, as you say, very English. Uh, so the response was, girl, bye. Uh, John Paul said, girl, bye. You know why people hate you. Uh, and uh, as you can see, how many hearts he received as opposed to her. All right, sir, I got to say this, uh, Mr. Mayor. I have seen a lot of things in my career. This damn near takes the cake. You literally have a person who says racism doesn't exist against black people in America. Then she cries racism when her husband receives a no from a white male. Her husband happens to be white too. Uh, this has to, at some point, lead you to the conclusion that I've come to already, dear brother. We are actually in the twilight zone. All right, yeah. thoughts? We're somewhere close to the twilight zone. It's called the grift zone. Uh, Candace Owens is a big, the biggest grift um, next to Donald Trump. And let, let me explain to you. Let me let me give you. She is willing to evoke Jim Crow era treatment of black people for her white husband from the UK, the country that actually created slave trade. It's unbelievable to me that she thinks slavery and racism doesn't exist over there. And also, Doc, Doc you and I both went to law school. She she screwed that hypo all the way up. She changed <laughs> one of the she changed one of the characters from white to black, and I'm right. I'm lost in her story. I, That's I was right. in the same situation. It don't work that way. And furthermore, here's the biggest grift that most people never talk about: Candace Owen herself sued white students in New Jersey for racism against That's her in right. high school, and won the case and kept the bread that came along with it. So she know racism exists. She's been a benefactor of black people who stood up to the system against racist white people in Connecticut when she was in high school, but she won't tell her white friends over there at the Republican Party that she's a grifter. Very well said. And the NAACP helped her in that lawsuit, ironically, the same group she bashes today. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable stick and stay. All right, welcome back. A lot of show left. Let me remind everyone to watch this, the big homie, J.R. Jackson. Don't forget, after you watch Unbossed with Nina Turner, make sure to stay tuned for the watch list. J.R. Jackson shares his take on stories you should pay attention to. 
news, politics, culture, current events, sports, and more. Subscribe to the watch list and watch live daily, 5 p.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Pacific time at youtube.com forward slash watch list, TYT, remarkable program. All right, let me read a few of these comments. All right, it says, so Sally St. Clair says, it's a white man's Bible that says to forgive the oppressor. Why? Let's take a moment. Northside Yanks uh, says, I'm pretty sure the guy saying sorry heard his friend talk like that before. Yeah, probably so. Okay. All right. This is one of the saddest stories you will ever hear. A 17-year-old, a young person, sleep inside of a car, shot, killed by the police. Here it is. These officers created the danger, engaged in reckless, malicious, murderous conduct. Now a 17-year-old black father is dead. Put up the picture. We have one photo of him when he was alive, being a dutiful father, caring compassionate. What you just saw was the police body cam footage showing U.S. Park Police startling and then fatally shooting a 17-year-old young male. His name, Delano Martin. He was shot in the back five times after he fell asleep in a vehicle. They struck him in the head. Metropolitan Police Department officers and two U.S. Park Police officers responded to a call about a suspicious vehicle. Please understand that really means a suspicious black man inside of a car. That's what that means. It's not a suspicious vehicle. It's a suspicious black male. So they get a call about a suspicious black male who's doing nothing. This was on March 18th. The authorities arrived. They saw Mr. Martin sleeping in a stolen vehicle. Video released by the U.S. Park Police on April 4th showed two police officers climbing into the back of a white hatchback vehicle near 34th and Baker. This was around 9.30 a.m. The officers decided to cut the plastic from one of the windows to unlock the vehicle. Now, before I move on to the next part of this insane story, after conversations with multiple members of law enforcement uh, today, they made it very clear to me, these officers violated multiple rules of engagement when they approach a scene like that. I'm gonna get into that in just a moment. Prior to the shooting, the officers conspired on how to plan and startle, startle the teenager saying, and I quote, if he doesn't, if he doesn't get startled and he doesn't wake up, then we're going to try to get in there, grab him before he puts that car into gear, said one police officer. They entered the vehicle. If we can grab that hand, get a hold of that other one, we're good to go. But let's wait to see if he gets startled after I cut it, try to unlock the door. If he does, if he takes off, just let him go. But don't get inside that car till we, you know, end quote. Put up the picture of the family and the attorney. 
Now, before I get into Ms. Martin and the others, got to say this. Literally, the officers were on one accord with the policy, the protocol of approach, which was whatever you do, don't get inside of the vehicle. It creates a danger for everybody, including the cop. It creates a danger for the 17 year old. Don't get in the vehicle. Not only is it already stated policy on approach, it was restated again at the damn scene. Don't get in the vehicle. That is called a standing order. It's an SO. You have a standing command, a standing order. Don't get in the car. You're going to create a situation that makes it worse. One officer decided to ignore that standing order. And exactly what you saw happened went down. Tara Martin, the victim's mother, said at a recent news conference, and I quote, no mother should be here. I don't sleep, I don't eat, and justice needs to be served. My son should still be here. The video explains everything that they did. How can you justify this? And for anyone who will push back and say, well, obviously, uh, he was committing a crime. You don't know that. You don't know that. Let me tell you why you don't know that. Because he will never get the opportunity of due process in a court of law to prove that he's guilty. He's already innocent based on law. Innocent unless proven guilty. So they killed an innocent 17 year old father. And let's go down the rabbit hole just a bit. You see, I did some things as a juvenile that got me in trouble. I was a foster kid. I was a gang banger. I got involved in street elements that caused me to be labeled a juvenile delinquent. Just because I may have deserved to see a judge at times does not mean I should have seen a maker. This young man did not deserve to die. Cops are not judge, jury, and executioner, no matter what the cause is for the interaction. This is not their call to kill people they don't like or to violate protocol that ends in the death of another human being, especially one this young. They violated their own rules of engagement. There's more. Andrew O'Clark, an attorney for the family. Mr. O'Clark said, he welcomed the opening of a civil rights investigation and hinted that the family might pursue its own lawsuit. We will pursue justice for Delano with or without the help of the federal government or the District of Columbia. The Park Police Union defended the actions of the officer. Union Chairman Kenneth Spencer said that the shooting of Martin was justified. There was a lawful reason for him to be in the car. The use of force was justified. And the union stands behind the actions the officers took, said Spencer. The FBI announced on Tuesday that federal prosecutors have now opened a civil rights investigation into this shooting. I want to know the history. I want to know what other things they may have done against citizens that have been covered up. I want to know how many complaints from those in your local community have logged, have been logged against them. These are things that hopefully an investigation will uncover. But if we had the George Floyd Policing and Accountability Act, we would already have it on the record for all of us to see. You see, transparency is a policy in and of itself. And I know the mayor is very aware of how transparency can create a policy dynamic without passing a new law. Transparency itself can become a policy. Mr. Mayor, what are your thoughts about what you saw? You're on uh, mute, dear brother. I, I watched a young man get murdered, Dr. Richie, and, it, and, it, and it's, I mean, anybody saying anything other, watch a different video than we just watched. Uh, I don't understand this plot to scare and startle people. People sleep, being startled, react in strange ways. Um, I don't start on my wife because I might get punched. You, I don't understand what, what the outcome was other than, which makes me question the don't get in the car unless you know. What was the you know? Like, are we right. saying 
this is our motive. This is a reason for us to just kill this young man. I am the the the, the sentence, the charge for stealing a car is not murder. Yeah. It's not death. Um, I don't. It was e as easy as they got in that car. They could have easily put all of their squad cars around that car so he couldn't run and just knock on the window. Yeah. And wake him up. This idea that you need to cut through plastic and go in this car makes no sense to me. This is a to me this is a planned out attack, and we heard him planning. So I, I'm 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 deeply disturbed by the action. And then for the union office or the union police officer or representative to defend this officer while there are two ongoing investigations lets you know that they don't care about law. They don't care about investigation. They just care about their people. And I think caring about your people more than you do alone gets us in a situation where black people just keep winding up dead at the other end of police guns. That's right. Well said. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable. Stick and stay. All right. Welcome back. I got a question for everybody. What in the red state hell? You can take a gun, shoot somebody in the face. It's not hard. Sometimes it might even be fun if they're a godless commie. Now, what they're trying to do is sneak the COVID vaccine in your salads. I never had, I hate math. Somebody say amen. This freaking black communist, okay? They got the black mm -hmm. communists, like Barack Obama, Susan Rice, Valerie Jarrett, um, Brock, or, uh, Eric Holder. You got these black communists that, they want reparations and the billions of dollars. They want to run their freaking communist Hugo Chavez, Fidel Castro styled communism, you know, with uh, Jay Z, Mr. Do What Thou Wilt. Mm. These black satanic communists have, have taken over the bureaucracy. And they're, they're getting back at the man, aren't they? Hmm? The white man. Yeah, the white man. Taking down the white man. Sir, you're so racist that when you merely say the word black, we actually know what you mean. Okay. Let me correct you for the record, Mr. Racist Man. Uh, Jay-Z is a capitalist, uh, not a communist, um, evidenced by his recent contract with the NFL. Uh, also, uh, President Barack Obama opposes reparations for black people. Not in support of it. The other one's not really on record, except for Eric Holder to a lesser degree. Um, so you're just incorrect. But see, you can do that and still have a show because the people that listen to you and watch you, they don't give a damn about the truth. And you know that. You're like a mini-me, Tucker Carlson. Uh, you will spew lies contrary to proof and facts, knowing that your people are gullible enough to eat it up. So here we go. All black people are bad, according to him. And then there's this other conservative commentator who compares Trump to Jesus himself. Here it is. Uh, something that really kind of inspired me before I did this show uh, was hearing Ryan, what Ryan said in the episode that he did today, right before this, he said, uh, I would take a bullet for President Trump. And when he said that, I, at first I was a little taken aback. I was like, all right, Ryan, that's a little that's a little much. But then I thought about it for a split second, and then I realized, no, it's not. You know why? Because President Trump would take a bullet for me. President Trump is taking a bullet for me. President Trump is prepared to take a bullet for all of us. What he's doing is actually Christ-like, and I never thought that before until today. I actually used to make fun of people who would say that because I thought, okay, that's not made fun of them, but I would be like, all right, that's a little extreme, but he's literally going to prison for us. That'd be awesome, actually. Uh, Anna Perez is her name. Uh, do I actually do hope prison is going, I mean, Trump is going to prison uh, for you or whoever else. Uh, the first person was Peter Santilli. Uh, so now you have this Contrast. So white conservatives typically are saying, you know, former President Obama was the devil um, and Trump, Jesus. Wow. All right. Thoughts here, Mr. Mayor. I, I, are we watching TV? I mean, is it, where, where are we? These people have these people. These people have followers. That means there's a, a swath of American population that believes this ridiculousness. Yeah. There's a definition for communism. There's a definition for capitalism. There's a definition for satanic. Yeah. And, and what they what he's really saying is black equals all of that. That's right. Black equals all of that. 
Because if you believe that Trump is going to jail for you or going to take a bullet for you, you have not seen any of reality for the past 40 plus years. That's Trump right. ain't taking a bullet for nobody. Right. The man won't take a bullet for his own children. So let's be very clear about who he is. All right. Dear brother, always a pleasure, Mr. Mayor, having you on the program. Tell people how they can follow you and check out your great work. Yeah, I'm over at Robert HQ creating, creating a lot of noise. Yes. Uh, Mondale Robinson on Twitter. Always good, dear brother. You're doing a great job, man. We appreciate your leadership and your connection to us and the world. Thank you, brother right. Pete. We got more on the other side. The bullpen is next. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. This is Wesley Phelps. He's 28 years old. He was on drugs. He had priors for burglary and assault in a minor. He led police on a high-speed chase, crashed his car, and his girlfriend died. And Judge Sybil Reynolds gave him three years. But on the same day that Judge Sybil Reynolds gave him three years, he gave Lakeith Smith 65 years. Lakeith is 15 years old. Him and some other kids were breaking into an unoccupied dwelling. The cop showed up, the kids ran. The cop shot Adante Washington, which is Lakeith Smith's best friend, shot Adante in the back three times. Due to Alabama's felony murder law, Lakeith Smith was sentenced to 65 years for the murder of Adante, even though he didn't hold the weapon or shoot anybody. This happened on the same day in the same court by the same judge. 28-year-old who's actually responsible for somebody dying. 15-year-old who's actually not responsible for anybody dying. We covered this story. Such a shame. Uh, we want to thank Charlie for contacting the show, alerting us to this miscarriage of justice. On the program today, we have um, Lakeith Smith's mother, Lakeith Smith's mother. Her name is Brontina Smith. She goes by Tina. Thank you, Madam, for being on the program. Welcome. And also the attorney, Leroy Maxwell Jr. Uh, his practice focuses on appellate litigation, civil rights, and criminal defense. He has recovered millions and millions in injury cases and is a noted attorney at law. Thank you both for being on the show. Wish it was under better circumstances. What I would like to do is first express uh, my heart and care uh, to you, uh, Ms. Smith, because naturally I cannot imagine what you're going through. Uh, but if you would give us some insight as to what's happening now in this situation, in this case. Um, <clears throat> well, a little bit. Um, we had a court here, um, a court hearing for a resentencing on March 21st. Okay. We were so under the oppression that my son was coming home. Mm -hmm. um, we were we were confident, more than confident, actually. Uh, well, that, that was a blowback. Uh, my son's sentence was reduced to 30 years instead of 25, which is still a slap in the face. Um, so now we're going into um, the appellate stage. And, you know, we're going to keep fighting to get my son home, you know, and, um, take the justice. Yeah. Mr. Maxwell, let's talk about this from the legal side. Uh, we heard Ms. Smith just say uh, she just, you know, th there was a strong indication he could come home. Uh, obviously, the judge could have done this. Tell us the background to this case legally. Yeah, thank you so much for having us on. Um, like Tina said, he should have come home. Uh, with this case, he was sentenced uh, back eight years ago when uh, the time of the crime, uh, Lakeith Smith was only 15 years old. He went to trial for felony murder, and we'll talk about that felony murder rule, which is just a tremendous um, uh, disservice to our community, uh, to folks in general, that sort of law uh, that basically sentences people who don't have intent uh, and sends them to the harsh crimes as if they did have intent to commit something uh, heinous. And so he was ultimately sentenced to 65 years. Uh, we jumped in on his case. We filed pleadings showing that his sentence was unconstitutional. His trial counsel was awful uh, and woefully insufficient. Judge agreed with us on most of those counts and allowed us to have resentencing. 
went in there, uh, argued resentencing based on the fact of his age, other mitigating circumstances, uh, and how woefully insufficient his legal counsel was. Uh, the judge in this case came back with a reduction and sentence down to 30 years, uh, but we still believe that's a complete miscarriage of justice. Uh, Look, he should be home. He didn't kill anyone. He didn't intend to kill anyone. It was a bad police shooting where the officer killed this young man, his best friend, uh, kill shot in the back of the base of the neck, um, and they needed someone to take the blame. So they put their target towards Lakeith. Uh, he went to trial uh, because he did not want to admit to killing his friend, which he did not do. Uh, and now uh, he was faced uh, with 65 years. We got it reduced down, but he still needs to be home. Let's talk about the dysfunction of the justice system. Because I'm sure there was an opportunity for him to plead guilty to something at a lesser uh, penalty. Uh, he refused. Let's talk about how this got to a 65 year sentence of a 15 year old. I, I, you know, I don't know the law like you do, so I'm still in law school myself. But we've studied cases where we've considered that unconstitutional for a long time uh, to sentence a 15 year old to such uh, to such time. Right, I, I agree. And uh, I was there arguing uh, with Brian Stevenson, the landmark case and uh, Miller v. Jackson and um, yep. uh, where we argued that young folks should not be sentenced to these sort of harsh sentences, uh, ultimately to die in prison. Uh, and so what this judge did here, um, what Sibley Reynolds did, he basically found a way around that by not giving them a life sentence, but he gave them a 65 year sentence one that uh, the life expectancy of a black man, that's a death sentence. Uh, he sentenced him with the intent to make sure that he never comes out of that prison again. Uh, and so it's cruel. Unfortunately, uh, it's not unusual. And uh, you know uh, in law school that uh, both components have to be met, the cruel right. and unusual. Yep. It's absolutely cruel, but in Alabama and states like ours, it's not unusual. So we have a hard time meeting that Eighth Amendment burden. Wow. Wow. Before I go back to the mother, uh, Attorney Maxwell, let me ask you one more question. Uh, at this point, is there anything that can hold the judge accountable for the obvious um, difference between the sentencing of the white male and then the sentencing of the black male juvenile? Well, uh, typically, we know that this has gone on for for centuries, for for decade after decade, where there's been, been this complete uh, disproportionate uh, type of sentencing, uh, depending on skin color. Uh, and we've taken certain steps and legislate, legislation and other things to try to correct that. Uh, but we know that we can't correct the human side of it. We have a judge here who is inflicting that sort of white supremacist uh, identity uh, onto this case. As far as what it is that we could do, uh, this judge sentenced him and basically got out and retired. Uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, he still might oversee a few other cases, and we want to make it known. And I know that us and other organizations, uh, we're reviewing his cases right now. Uh, we saw what happened here, and we think there's a pattern. And if there is a pattern, there's probably a lot of our sons locked up and incarcerated for uh, uh, erroneous uh, um, miscarriage uh, of style sentences uh, that should be home right now. And so right. we want to hold them accountable and we want to make sure those who have been affected uh, receive some sort of uh, benefit. All right. We're going to go to a quick break. We'll be right back. We got more to come. It's indisputable stick and stay. All right. Welcome back. I still have um, Attorney Maxwell and also Ms. Smith. Uh, the mother of Lakeith Smith, who is incarcerated for something that happened when he was 15 years of age. He did not commit the criminal offense. This is one of those weird laws that basically attributes blame without a person forming mans rea or the intent to commit that particular crime. It's truly a tragedy. Um, Ms. Smith, let me ask you this question. Your son has been dealing with this ordeal since he was 15, obviously. You're a parent. I'm a parent. You've been dealing with it as well. Yes, what is the 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 sense from your son right now? Is he hopeful uh, that at some point this justice system will wake up and judge itself? 
Well, um, my son, he is, he's very hopeful because he know that, that we're out here and we're fighting. Um, he's more hopeful toward us in the system itself. Yeah. You know, we were, he knows that if we are dependent on the system, uh, you know, we'll probably get no help. So mm-hmm. thank God for the team that we have, you know, that's helping us to um, open eyes, you know, to the Alabama system. You know, he, he knows that we're trying our best and we're going to get him home. Let me ask you this. When all of this first happened um, and there's a trial, there's this prosecution, what was going through your mind, Ms. Smith? Did you believe that the system would at least uh, not go this extreme with your son? Originally, it was six to five years. What were your thoughts during the time of trial? Well, um, yeah, I, initially, I didn't think that um, the judge at first, you know, uh, uh, take a 15-year-old and just and just give his life away, just take, take sure. his life away. Right. I didn't, and, I, and I thought at first that the attorney that we had, um, that we hired, I thought that she was also on our team. She was going to fight, you know, for us to, you know, and, 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 and let's be clear, to get some time, maybe the time for the burglary, okay. you know, absolutely not the time for the death of a Dante Washington. Right. And right. so it, 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 it came to be clear, you know, that the system was definitely not on our side. I, maybe like um, the first, the second half of day one in the courtroom, um, everything became so clear mm. that we were going to have, you know, that things was, was going to go not in our favor. Let me do this. I want to put up the GoFundMe graphic. I want to put that up full screen. Um, Ms. Smith, I want you to tell us about the key. What kind of young man is he? Uh, witty, um, smart, real smart. Um, when I had him on the when I had him out here with me on the street, as we say, um, fun, funny, fun to be around. Um, family oriented, you know, spoiled. Just a typical, you know, American black boy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, oh man, prankster. I love football. You know, just, you know, what you do at 15, you know, you get up and go hang out with your friends, come home and, and tear the refrigerator down, you know. Mm-hmm. Just a, a those, typical boy. Those years, his childhood has been uh, disrupted in a way that he can never really get back. Taken away. Uh, yeah, completely taken away. Here's what I want viewers to do. Uh, we're going to put that GoFundMe up again. I want you to give, I want you to give your very best because this is going to be a marathon for him and his family. Uh, But I believe as the mother, I believe as attorney Maxwell Jr., I believe that the young Lakeith Smith is going to be victorious eventually. I believe that our justice system will be proven to be not only wrong, but immoral in their prosecution and sentencing of this child. And I believe that Mr. Lakeith Smith will be one of our generational leaders in this nation. You can be part of the process of his justice because when he gets justice, we get justice. Great, absolutely. All right, attorney, what's yes, next? Sir. What can we do? Uh, just like you said, uh, share, go out and donate, support uh, Ms. Tina Smith, uh, the coalition, and all that we're doing because we're just not bringing attention to Lakeith's case. We're bringing attention to this rogue felony murder rule. Uh, We have too many folks that I'm sitting in front of, mothers, fathers, explaining to me that their child didn't pull a trigger, didn't do anything, uh, yet they're facing a life sentence for uh, this crime called felony murder. And so we wanna bring awareness to it. I think if people knew just how atrocious it was and how rogue it's become, uh, uh, they they would be shocked. Uh, and so we want to bring attention to that and force our legislators and other folks uh, to do the right thing, not just for Lakeith, but for everyone out there who's suffering because of this law. Very well said. Um, to you both, um, to Ms. Uh, Tina Smith, I appreciate your strength and courage. Um, to Attorney Maxwell, thank you for your advocacy and your expert legal prowess. We appreciate Absolutely. your continued and collective leadership. All right, we're gonna to continue to follow this. Naturally, if you need anything, make sure you reach out, okay? Thank, right. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, my pleasure. All right, remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable. <laughs>